Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Planetary Science Journal has concluded that Saturn's rings are heating up its upper atmosphere. Using collaborative data from the Hubble Space Telescope and the Cassini Space Probe, this study confirmed the heating up of the gas giant's upper atmosphere and proposed several possibilities as to why this is happening, such as micrometeorites, solar radiation and ice particles from its rings falling into the atmosphere. The study acknowledges the already known slow disintegration of Saturn's rings, but its role in heating the planet up was not previously known. In using data gathered from multiple sources, the team can confirm the validity of their findings, instead of having to grapple with potential illusory data of Saturn that has sometimes been suggested from the Cassini space probe. As with all closer examinations of planets in our solar system, data gathered in this study can be extrapolated to our knowledge of planetary formation and life across the universe, expanding our potential understanding of exoplanets so we can better understand them with the limited data we can gather from such a distance. And in other news, I'd like to quickly mention the announcement of the crew for NASA's next mission to the Moon. Artemis II will not land on the Moon, but it will loop around and the astronauts selected are Royd Wiseman, Victor Glover, Christina Koch and Jeremy Hansen. The mission that will actually land on the moon is still a while away, but this is an important step in returning humanity to that little grey rock in the sky. And finally from me this week, OneWeb has completed its final satellite launch in its bid to launch a powerful internet network consisting of a total of 618 satellites. A strong competitor to SpaceX's own brand Starlink, OneWeb will instead be selling to larger telecoms companies that provide individual services instead of directly providing individual services to their customers. It will be a while before these services are fully running however, as the satellites still need to be properly positioned, configured and ground infrastructure needs to be completed as well. OneWeb was close to bankruptcy just three years ago. So this recovery has been a big boost for the UK space sector and another step in massive global satellite fleets. And now over to Ben with the nettle. Thanks Doug. Well the paleontology news has been very exciting recently, starting off with a new paper describing a new genus and species of shark relative from Morocco. Dating to the late Devonian period, about 365 million years ago, fossils representing several individuals of a fish named as Magrobosalaki mohamezanii have been reported. This fish is not a true shark, but is a member of the Chondrichthians, the fish with cartilaginous skeletons that include sharks, rays, skates and chimeras, and is actually more closely related to the modern chimeras, being classified in the same group as them, holocephaly. Anyway, these fossils are remarkable and actually preserve some soft tissue traces in a few of them. The unique thing about the anatomy of Magrobosalaki though, is the fact that this ancient fish had a very broad snout with large separated nasal capsules, making it look almost like a very early hammerhead shark, or perhaps more like a bonnethead. Indeed, the authors themselves write that this might mean Magrobosalaki had sensory specialisations in its head approaching that of modern wide-snouted sharks such as the hammerheads and it's now the earliest record of this condition evolving in the history of cartilaginous fish. So this discovery also shows how diverse these animals got even among their earliest members, and is a fantastic addition to our understanding of Chondrichthian evolution. Also in the news is an interesting paper investigating the reproductive habits of theropod dinosaurs. This study looked at eggshell fossils from Troodon, which if you've been keeping up with the news you might remember was actually invalidated as a species, but this paper seems to ignore that so let's just roll with it. Troodon, or at least Troodon-like animals, are key to understanding how various changes in the physiology of non-bird dinosaurs occurred along the lineage leading to the birds, and using something called dual clumped isotope thermometry, this paper has been able to find out at what temperature the eggshells of this dinosaur were formed, which is pretty mind-blowing honestly. They found that the eggshells were formed at variable temperatures, between about 42 and 30 degrees celsius showing that these were indeed endothermic animals and were able to change their body temperature according to their needs, as modern birds can do. Other interesting results of the paper are that the actual rate of eggshell calcification in Troodon was slower, more like reptiles than birds, and that they likely retained two ovaries instead of having one, like modern birds. It also turns out that Troodon could only have produced about four to six eggs every time they reproduced, and so large nests attributed to this dinosaur that contain over 20 eggs were therefore likely shared between multiple females. 
Some fascinating implications for dinosaur paleobiology and reproduction there then, and an amazing method they used to find this out. And finally, in this action-packed week, it's what you've all been waiting for. The lip debate continues. As I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, especially if you've seen my video on the topic, there has been a lot of online discussion about the idea that theropod dinosaurs, in particular T-Rex, didn't have their teeth exposed when they closed their mouths and had extra oral soft tissues that would cover them. Up until now, this debate has mostly been on blog posts, Twitter, and in YouTube videos, but now there's been an actual paper published in the journal Science properly investigating this discussion. Well, the approach they used is very interesting, and there's lots of good quantitative data here that support lips having been present in dinosaurs such as Tyrannosaurus, which is a relief for me because it means that video I did is still accurate. Anyway, the study looks at tooth length relative to skull size in living monitor lizards and a variety of theropods, finding that it's entirely plausible and quite likely that the dinosaurs would have had their teeth completely covered by gums and scales on the lips, as is the condition in monitors which can have some relatively pretty massive teeth obscured by such tissues. Scaling up the relationship between tooth and skull size to big theropods, it's clear that it matches monitor lizards pretty well, disproving the argument that some dinosaurs had teeth too large to be covered by lips and gum. Another angle of approach used in the study was looking at tooth wear patterns and comparing them to living crocodilians. Crocodilians, which have exposed teeth and no lips, often have eroded enamel on their outer sides since the teeth are always uncovered, but this is very different to the condition seen in a Dyspletosaurus tooth they thin-sectioned which only showed a bit of wear from contact with the opposing lower tooth. The patterns observed here are therefore again much more consistent with a soft tissue covering over the dentition. So there we have it, even more evidence in support of lips in theropods. I'm sure this is a discussion that will continue long into the future, but it's pretty cool to see an actual paper on this subject. Let us know what you think about this new evidence in the comments below, and how do you think this will influence paleomedia in the future? Anyway, happy first contact day, only 40 years to go now, and back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you on Sunday.